Well, good afternoon and welcome to the Library of Congress. I'm Librarian of Congress, uh, Carla Hayden, and it's wonderful to see everyone here in the Pickford uh, Theater and greetings to everyone watching on the live stream. I'm thrilled to be here to introduce Maya Cade, whose lecture today is titled, Try a Little Tenderness. <laughs> and when you say that, what a wonderful title, you see you almost want to break into song, <laughs> like Aretha Franklin and Otis Redding, who both sang the song and embodied it. And we are so delighted to have uh, Maya here because since 2022, and you, many of you may know, she's the creator and the curator of the Black Film Archive. And she was the library, and still is, the library's first Connecting Communities Digital Initiative, as we call it CCDI, Scholar in Residence. And she's been engaged in what we have to say is a transformative act at the library. She's been spending hours searching through films, videos, books, and more, looking for moments of tenderness in African-American representation in media. And I love that idea that the Library of Congress is a place where one can find a little tenderness. <laughs> so Maya will share with you what she's found, and she will also unveil her updated website, Black Film Archive, which will stream films from the Library of Congress's collection. And the library, as you may also know, has one of the largest black film collections. And it is through Maya's work that we will be able to share those films more widely with the world. Her work is also part of a larger library initiative that began in 2021. And that initiative is Of the People Widening the Path, which was made possible by a very generous grant from the Mellon Foundation. And if you see anything appear on the screen, it's because I have touched a key. <laughs> and I'm going to back up my notes, because this could, this could go left, as the young people say. So what Of the People was created for was to add the perspectives and collections of more people to the Library of Congress's collections allowing that national library that we are to share more stories, more complete stories about the United States and the world. And the CCDI was born out of that program and was intended to focus on getting more people to use the library's digital collections. What CCDI offers is financial and technical support to artists, scholars, higher education, institutions, libraries, archives, and museums to remix and reuse the library's digital collections. When we initiated the program three years ago, I admit I had high hopes for what of the people and CCDI could make possible. Maya's residency and work has far exceeded my expectations and proven that access can lead to wonderful discovery and creativity. So thank you, Maya, for your work and your vision. And I present to you, this is like the Academy Awards. <laughs> the envelope, please, Miss Maya Cage. Thank you so much. <laughs> well, I'm a little overwhelmed. <laughs> I want to thank the Librarian of Congress for that sincerely warm introduction. I'm touched. Thank you to everyone who's in attendance today, in person, over Zoom. It's my sincere honor to share with you my research on tenderness and black film and how that research has transformed my personal scholarship. So let's get started. <laughs> Today's agenda will begin with early black portraiture and cinematic possibility as a foundation of our conversation. Then we will transition to actively defining tenderness in black cinema 
and the ways it manifests on screen with active examples. And finally, we'll map out how tenderness is displayed on the extension site of Black Film Archive that houses this project. At the end of my presentation, there will be a moment to ask questions, whether in person or Zoom, so have them locked and loaded for me. I'm ready. <laughs> Let's get started. Early Black portraiture and Black cinematic possibility. It only feels natural to, to ground today's conversation with Frederick Douglass. Douglass, a staunch believer in the power of the photo, who was likely the most photographed person of the 19th century, his admiration for photography was not only the of, for the mechanics of the form, but also the ways that imagery could transform black dignity and cultural knowledge creation. Douglas argued, as his on-screen quote in his lecture, Pictures in Progress, illustrates, that picture making determines what it means to be human, who is worthy of basic dignity. He contended that photography and view, pit, photography creation and viewing were a tool of social transformation. Writing, the process by which a man is able to invert his own subjective consciousness into the objective form considered in all its range is the truth, the highest attribute of a man's nature. Imagery then, when we take it into our own hands, must be the foundation of progress while also paying honor to our past. Douglas recognized that loved ones can be remembered by future generations unknown, and that the silent, unending influence and meaning that photos carry can transform the generations to come. Which is to say, Douglas believed that by fashioning ourselves as ornaments of observation, we are able to imagine uncharted futures as a race. Oh, I will go back and to say that. Uh, these photos are from the digital collection at the library. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> du Bois, W.B. W. Du Bois, a staunch admirer of Douglas, and in many ways carried the flame that Douglas left behind in the wake of his passing in 1895. By 1900, Du Bois curated an exhibition in Paris that comprised of images of black women, men, and children collected across time and circumstance. Across the imagery Du Bois collected, it's clear he understood two essential things. The role of photography breaking monolithic ideas of blackness and the role of image as a beacon of immortality. Centering ourselves and our image not only forcibly provided a contrast between the racist imagery prevailing during this time, but also acted as an inter-community revolution. And this photo is uh, one of the images he collected for that Paris exhibition, which is on the library's website. <laughs> the work of Du Bois and Douglas alike shifted the ground upon which the production and circulation of cultural knowledge stand on. Du Bois' individual influence cannot, cannot be understated. As co-founder of the NAACP and eventual editor of NAACP's Crisis Magazine, educator, writer, and editor, it's no underestimation to say his understandings of image are translated into today's scholarship. In a February 1926 issue of Crisis Magazine, Du Bois poses a questionnaire to the magazine's readership about the ways that black people are represented in art. What are Negroes to do when they are continuously painted at their worst and judged by the public as they are painted? The scholar asks. That question was echoed nearly a century later as black audiences posed a question in a similar vein in response to black cinema's curation online and theatrically during the George Floyd protests of 2020. Are all black films traumatic? The tenderness scholarship I'm building is in direct response to that ongoing impulse. <laughs> the question Du Bois posed is also one <laughs> It's gorgeous, I know. <laughs> the question Du Bois posed is also one pioneering black directors ask themselves. Black artists across cultural making recognize that stereotypical media images work hand in hand with white racist fantastical image making to determine the treatment of black people in the world. 
What Du Bois and Douglas recognized in still imagery, the next generation of black artists acted upon in the moving image. Oscar Michaud, born in 1884 in Illinois and the son of former slaves, used cinema as a tool to confront lynching, white supremacy, intercommunity corruption, you know, the fact that people pass for white and mainstream ideas of blackness. Writing, I have always tried to make my photo plays present the truth, to lay before the race a cross-section of its own life, to view the colored heart from close range. My results might have been narrow at times due to perhaps limited situations which I endeavor to portray, but in those limited situations, the truth was the predominant characteristic. It is only by presenting these portions of the race portrayed in my pictures that the light and background of their true state, that we can raise our people to greater heights. Leading with this desire to tell the truth, pioneering black directors who were mirrored in Michaud's pursuit did not reduce black imagery to homogeneity, but instead conveyed a complex truth familiar to black audiences. The rise of race films, black films to black audiences, created between the early 1900s until the 1950s, coincided with Hollywood's rise of a system of myth-making production and widely distributing said myths. To work to reveal the truth of a population as an inherently tender act, I would argue. Hanging in the balance between culture necessity and market demands, these black directors' courage to craft a story and cinematic world of their own design meant that black film pioneers were courageous enough to pursue that act despite cultural and structural barriers. The reward for their, their courage is a rich history that resists categorization and convention. Understanding the foundation of which black film stands is essential to expanding our definitions of it. As I stated earlier in my presentation, the idea of tenderness in black film was conceived in direct response to the wide prevailing idea that black cinema is inherently dramatic. Through the work of Douglas Du Bois and black film pioneers, image making as an idea can be seen as black futuristic and of impossibility can be tender. So now let's work on the definition. Tenderness, pointed moments of affection where black possibility, transformation and connection bloom. Something I've been repeating to myself since my work in tenderness began is that love enriches the senses and tenderness awakens them. By that I mean, love is impossible to feel without tender gestures, nods of understanding, warmth. Tenderness and its gestures open the pathways for love and connection. Early in my research, I wanted to granularly examine films by tenderness essentials, essential elements, but landed at recognizing tenderness in black film through family, community, romance, and self and soul. So first up, I will talk about the tenderness of family and we'll begin with a clip. We were a family of one. We understood one another. Had it not been so, my mother wouldn't have been able to keep in touch with her relatives for a hundred years. And she knew just about who was who. And we all did. So, closeness from the beginning until now, down to the time, from s slavery to now. As you just saw in this clip of this wonderful film, Happy Birthday, Miss Craig, Lulu Sadler Craig, the child of slaves, has her entire, has her family, five generations, gathering to celebrate her 102nd birthday. And she explains how family is essential to her understanding of life. Throughout this film, she reminisces on her family's journey from slavery to her eventual path of being a homesteader in Colorado. She was reminiscing on her life's joys, memories, and pains. Black people are more often than not the living embodiment of family memory, 
and the act of continual con creation that, me that memory provides. To be given care as a child, despite the circumstances that we are born into, is to know that a family's image of tenderness, through that, anything is possible. And as I write here, <laughs> our family's image is the first indication and in lessons of tenderness tenderness's possibilities are planted in our lives. Through a black cinema, these visions manifest in family stories, home videos, and dramas. Next, we have the tenderness of community. And it feels right to talk about Cooley High. And Cooley High is a film you may all be familiar with. It's a slice of life film that focuses on Two best friends in Chicago's North Side, uh, played by Glenn Turman and Lawrence Hilton Jacobs. And their life takes an abrupt turn during the last few weeks of their senior year of high school. This film, where the friendship between the two leads are essential to their understanding of life, is tender as the final transformation of Preach happens. I offered this film because I want to express that tender films aren't necessarily happy or devoid of what is often just express a shorthand for trauma. Tender gestures for black people and how it's represented in cinema give us the will to live, to carry on, and to pursue in a world that perhaps wants otherwise. So as I write um, with community, which I'm defining as friends and neighbors, tenderness appears as an investment in the betterment of each other, gestures of understanding and deepened connection. The investment allows us to see possibilities our families may not have been able to provide or teach. Through black cinema, these visions can manifest in dramas or comedies. And now, tenderness of the self and soul. So I have another clip. Zora Neale Hurston's fieldwork footage, shot between 1928 and 29, while the famed author was an anthropology student at Columbia University, Hurston captured the intricacies of living among the rural black communities that she found along her way. This clip was essential for me to show as it gives voice to the fact that directors capturing a community unseen and unrecognized on film can be a tender act. The complexities of everyday lives also includes the joys Hurston captured on screen. And tenderness of the self and soul is manifested through portraits the dynamic expression of our lives on film that enhances our capacity for understanding. This can be seen through the director who takes a lens to the lives of the black community that would otherwise be invisible, or from an artist turning a lens on themselves to reveal the truth that only comes from transformation. Last, but certainly not least, the tenderness of romance. And I have another clip. Yamakra is a wildly visually inventive short featuring a close-knit black community on the outskirts of Savannah, Georgia. At the heart of this musical drama is a young man who falls for a woman and follows her to the big city in a tender display of romantic and community love. This major studio release, Warner Brothers, is important to position its conversation for a few reasons. It builds a world around John P. Johnson, a black artist's composition of the same name, and as a Frederick Douglass quote pointed out earlier, the pictures do not change, but how we view them does. Though the setting depicting in this clip can be seen as unsetting, as upsetting, <laughs> or one might even say it is racist, using a tenderness approach of analysis, we know that images work on multiple levels and have more to reveal to us than the immediately evident. 
then. For my definition of tenderness and romance, I say that tenderness of romance is manifested through an embrace, a loving gaze, an unfolding of the truest self, and the opening of hearts in the way that romance promises. Romantic love can be seen in black film as the prize for survival in black dramas, or the hope of tenderness transformation in romantic home videos. Romantic love is not a singular vision of progress or the model for, of our being, but on a spectrum of the tenderness we welcome in our lifetimes. I think something that was really important for me as I was building this is to not just dwell on romantic love. And though that it's prevalent in how we view our lives in films and how we view our lives in real life, and it's you know often the prize for being a good person, or at least we tell ourselves that, I think that tenderness exists on a spectrum and we should allow that in our lives and also, and also how we view black cinema. And as I move into discussing the site's expansion, I want to add that al analyzing films through a tender lens is in conversations with the desires planted in our lives at birth. To dream of a world with love and care, to give voice to those who have been silenced or torn from the pages of history, to believe in black futures enough to will the impossible into existence, to not ab abandon ourselves and others out of fear. May we learn to say things without words, embrace others and ourselves with tenderness, and run to all gent gentleness that approaches with care and allow cinema to be a guide when we cannot trace the impulses alone. So <laughs> that leads me to how I map this out on my site. Tenderness.blackfilmarchive.com is live at this very moment. Um, there was a lot of thought that went into this expansion um, because it is the first major expansion of the site and it is a, a world within itself. Um, through my work with the researcher librarians at the Library of Congress, I've learned a lot about categorizing data, subject headings, uh, and all the fun things <laughs> that archivists and researchers enjoy. Through my work here, I've transformed Black Film Archive from living on an Excel spreadsheet to compiling it to be on a database that is relational, which is a major <laughs> advancement in my life. But after a conversation with subscribers and people who just subscribed to Black Film Archive, there was a lot of thought about not wanting the site to be cumbersome, it's something I, I kind of was repeated to me because I think something that I've learned through my work since I've been here is that even if something is a best practice doesn't mean it's a best practice for a, when you're trying to serve a certain community and and my goal I mean my vision when I initially started this was to have something that was you know for researchers and they could you know learn everything and but speaking to my audience, it was like, um, you know, <laughs> I don't know if that's what I desire. So I think, so here's where I landed, all that to say. <laughs> so um, I made a new, and I, I built this myself, and I made a new um, splash page. So this is Something Good Negro Kiss. It's on a GIF when it's actually on the page running. And I welcome um, with you know, a different kind of um, heading than the site has now. It links to Black Film Archive itself, which the link underneath is Black Film Archive Exhibition. And then a quote that says, love ain't what it is, it's easy to fall in love, but will someone please tell me how to stay there? <laughs> By Love Jones, which is, yes, <laughs> yes, which is a beloved film. And I thought this was the perfect way to welcome people into the site because Black Film Archive it, you know, it, it has old films, and it also now, because of this work, goes into the 90s. So it has new films, too. So organizing tenderness. I thought a lot about this, and as I kind of mentioned earlier, that I didn't want to be too cumbersome. And I, when I first started this research, I wanted to do things like gestures of understanding and I wanted to analyze each film <laughs> that way but realized that's difficult to understand as an audience member and what are some ways that I can succinctly de deliver what I'm trying to say and so organizing through community, family, romance and self and soul 
became those kind of pillars that I saw over and over again that I knew had to be the organizing principle of the site. And finally, I'll show you a video of what the site looks like now. But I realize I scrolled on too fast. But there's an introductory essay that talks through a lot of the ideas that I presented today. Um, how does tenderness appear in black cinema, the navigational that I shared, and then a description of that. And now the site also has, um, and, you know, the pages are the same. But now the site also has um, public tags. So you can navigate the site in more ways than you could before because those tags that I'm not clicking in this example video are clickable. So you can also explore that way. So that is the expansion site. That is my research. And I really want to say thank you to everyone who supported my research, my family and extended community, the research librarians who answered unending questions. I asked many questions. I, I wanted many things and they <laughs> made it possible for me. And the supporters of Black Film Archive since 2021, it's beyond my wildest dreams. I think your trust and support has to navigate Black film history is one of the greatest honors of my life. And now I will take your questions. If you're in the audience, raise your hand and enunciate so I can repeat your question back to the Zoom audience. If you're on Zoom, my colleague will make me aware of your questions. So thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Ask me anything. <laughs> yes. Hi. Um, I remember you talking previously about how you characterize what you define as a black film. Yes. And I wondered if you could share a little bit more about what constitutes a black film for you. Yes. So the organizer principle of what a black film is for the site has not changed, which is something significant to say about the black experience. I think how it changes for this world within itself, this microsite, is that now these films have to be transformative for the black experience, which just adds another layer and has to be something that, sorry, I had to think of the screen, uh, something that is said that it um, relates to family, community, self and soul, or romance. So if I'm not able to categorize it into those pillars, then I don't think that it's a tender film as my current definition has for it, but it would just be on blackfilmarchive.com itself. Yes. I have a question from a, a virtual audience member, Julia. Um, how did you decide on tenderness as a subject to dive in so deeply? Huh, Julia. Thank you, Julia. Uh, <laughs> I think if you know anything about me, you know that I'm a person that really thinks about the world in terms of love. And that is my guiding principle in life. So it feels only natural for me to want to build scholarship around love, tenderness, and trying to give people a new lane of understanding film. I think, you know, as I said in my lecture, people really, I mean, my impulse to create Black Film Archive generally was this kind of same conversation that was happening, which is that, oh, you know, all black films are traumatic, all black films are this, and this kind of limited space of possibility of what a black film could exist. But it's not my, my opinion that we should shame people for what they do not know. My only question becomes, what is a way to show it to them? What is a way to provide them a new way in? And so I think Black Film Archive serve serves a very specific purpose as for one type of person. Tenderness as a guide to understand a film serves a purpose for another person. And I would also say, because I have analytics on my site, <laughs> that I know that the ages, the age ranges of people who visit are wide. So there are people who visit the site who do not know what Blockbuster is. And there are also people who <laughs> visit the site who that's their first film experience, or the people who, you know, remember 
the only time you could see a film is on Saturdays at a certain time. You know, so there's this there's this idea that if I want to be accessible archive, that I must continuously think of ways to serve my audience, and that is the the way I lead. And tenderness speaks to me, and I hope it speaks to my audience as well. Yes. What you've done is phenomenal. First of all, uh, second of all is. How do you plan to update it if you do plan it? Is that something that you will be doing? Yes, uh, yes. Any suggestions maybe from the public as well? Exactly. So um, what I will launch when I leave today is a question form. So you, if you have an idea of tenderness that I overlooked or that you think, oh, this is miscategorized, I want you to argue with me. I want you to be like, mm, I'm not loving this. Like, <laughs> because I think... Even though I'm the steward of Black Film Archive, I want, you know, this is, I feel like this is for everyone. So if you want to fight me on something, I'm, I'm ready for the fight. So. <laughs> I don't want to fight you, but can I, <laughs> can I offer some, uh, one that I wonder if you've seen? Oh, please. Stevie Wonder does the soundtrack to a film called The Secret Life of Plants, and I see that you've used flowers as symbols of tenderness. Well, what you don't know about me is that that's my favorite Stevie Wonder album. <laughs> so I ask you then, have you seen the clip Black Orchid? Yeah, well, so it, I, the film just got restored recently. And I hesitate to put things that are about to have a better, much better version <laughs> online because the version that is online right now is Very barely cool. viewable. Yeah. And I love that album. So I want to make sure that as I'm exhibiting film in the way that I am, that I'm giving people, if I, if I know something has been restored, that I'm giving people a, like a, fill, a full look at that film, a full experience. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, hi. Uh, hi. Love your work. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Um, there's so much like tenderness in the way that you talk about your work. Oh. What's your favorite thing that you've learned from doing this project so far? <sighs> <laughs> What is my favorite thing I've learned since doing this project so far? I think I've learned a lot about myself and knowing that so often we feel like we're in competition with the, the cute thing of the month and that it's a race to, you know, be better than whatever thing. And that's not really how my that's not how I internally feel, but I think when your work reaches a lot of people quickly, that that kind of pressure is put on you in, in various ways. And I think this project, sitting with films that I have already seen or new films to me in a different way, reminds me that scholarship is abundant, that there is the only person I'm racing against as you know, bettering the past version of myself being open to new experiences and, and new knowledge and knowing that the more I learn, it feels like the less I know and being open to not thinking I'm above anything, above a suggestion, above knowledge, you know, all of that. So I think I've just learned <laughs> a lot about myself and a lot about archiving generally. Cause I think, you know, I, when I launched this project, I, this, this was kind of just my impulse of what I thought should exist. And some of those impulses were right. And I've learned different things. Doesn't mean that I'm, I was once wrong, but how do I then take that knowledge I have and bring it to the site without losing my audience? Because I don't want anyone to get left behind. So, thank you. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> what's up next for me um I think I have a lot of exciting things I cannot talk about <laughs> but I think what's up next for me is continuing to, continuing to learn about black cinema in new ways um I think one thing that's really exciting for me that's up next is there are a lot of people who have seen my site and wanted to create something of their own. And so I have a lot of like one-on-ones with people who are trying to 
figure out ways that they can make a specialized, maybe not even a film archive, but a specialized archive, uh, cultural archive. And that's like, really exciting. <laughs> so, I, you know, anything like that where I can share what I know, um, it's always a joy. So, yes. Yes, Alicia. <laughs> You mentioned your audience and you don't want to lose your audience. You mentioned that, and I'm sure your audience that's helped you get here is near and dear to your heart. Can you define who your audience is and how you would like it to grow and who you would like to expand to? Yes, um, and the question was, can I define who my audience is and how I'd like to expand and like it to grow? The site is designed with black audiences in mind. That is the audience that's who I write for, because I write every description of every film. That, it, that is the audience. Um, I think, of course, it reaches beyond that. But knowing that my audience is specialized in that way allows me a certain kind of freedom that I, I feel, because I know I'm talking to people not in translation. I don't have to constantly translate my thoughts. Um, how would I like it to grow? I think there are a lot of people who... Something I think about all the time is there are a lot of people who don't understand the joys of cable. Like this idea, <laughs> this idea that there was once a place where you could turn on and something was programmed for you. Like, so a lot of people feel like they're, they're having like choice anxiety, really, in a way. And so I, what I'm hoping to do is to reach people in a different way. I think about what does it mean to program things, like a true film programmer. And how do I continuously reach people on the opposite end of the spectrum who, you know, that is how they understand film. So how do I continue, continuously surprise and delight is the, <laughs> is the question. But new audiences, I'm really focused on my main audience. <laughs> I, I don't want to lose sight of, of the people I'm doing it for. You know what I mean? I know, I know you know. <laughs> yeah. uh, yes. First of all, thank you for the work you're doing. It's absolutely so important, and so thank you for doing it. Two, how many um, films are represented in your archives, and have you been inspired to think about becoming a filmmaker yourself? <laughs> The question was, how many films are in the archive, and have I been inspired to become a filmmaker? There are now over 450 films in the archive um, with the Tenderness Project, <laughs> you know, combined. Um, there, it's it's a lot, <laughs> and then there's some that um, are ready to go. So I'm like, there, there, yeah, I had to count <laughs> to open the new site. Um, have I been inspired to become a filmmaker? I moved to New York <laughs> five years ago to pursue screenwriting. And you know that is kind of how my, my way into film is as, as a writer. Um, I went to Howard in DC, of course. H-U, yes, yes, you know. And I studied journalism. <laughs> I study journalism and, um, you know, this, this fascination with film. And when I was at Howard, I was the culture editor of the Hilltop and then I was the deputy editor. So this fascination with film has followed me for a long time. And when I moved to New York five years ago, I, I was like, you know, maybe it's the time to really be a screenwriter. Of course, then the pandemic happened. <laughs> and Black Film Archive is really a pandemic project that I, you know, that I cultivated reading my books in my library that were about black film and, you know, having something to come out of that. So it kind of feels like that screenwriting part has been halted in a way, but it's still my priority. So hopefully <laughs> you'll see like, oh my God, Maya, that girl, she's a film, you know, that's <laughs> that dialogue you do. I hope you can, I hope you can do that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Brian, is there a Zoom question? Uh, yeah, there's there's a couple dozen questions. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna try to combine a, a couple of similar ones. Okay. Um, uh, these set of questions are around um, 
things you found while doing your research. So maybe an example of a joyful discovery and something that was particularly surprising. Yes. Okay. A joyful discovery. Um, there is a film I saw at the library and it's escaping me, but I, I, I know the first name of the artist, but the artist's name is Minnie. I'm forgetting the, the last name. But this artist, um, she, at the time of the, at the time of this video was taken of her, she's maybe 82, and she is painting her dreams. And she is, you know, has these very, like, very heavy religious symbol dreams, and she doesn't, she says she doesn't see anything, that she wakes up and she just paints what she saw. And I saw that film really early into my research. And I was just like, oh, I'm doing the right thing here. Because that is the kind of the thing that I was like, oh, that you know, this idea of tenderness existing for the soul and self, really seeing that film helped me determine what exactly the definition would be. And that's kind of stayed with me. So definitely a lot of surprises. Would you like me to ask another one? Yes, please. <laughs> Next one's from Mike Michonne. Since oh, Mike! Uh, can you elaborate on your plans for making more films available through the Black Film Archive? And thanks for being so accessible. Oh, Mike used to work at the library. Don't know. And before I started the library, I'm going to put him on blast, and he's probably chuckling right now, but. Before I started at the library, he sent me an email and he was just like, I really like what you're doing. I really like how you're making films accessible. And that email, and he, and I knew then that I was going to be a scholar in residence, but he didn't. And so he just, he was just emailing me and that's just the kind of person he is. And so he kind of, he changed my life. But um, my goals of making things more accessible. Yes, Mike, I <laughs> am. <laughs> and, and continuously to update the site. I think... The work of tenderness isn't a pause, and you know, it doesn't end when the residency ends. I think it's something that I have to continuously seek new films. I think a, you know, a lot of films are uploaded each day. Curators for various streaming sites are doing interesting things, which is exciting. And so in the ways that Black Film Archive is continuously updated, continuously updated, I believe that the tenderness project will be. How am I making it more accessible? I am thinking about what does it mean for me to host, for example, a public domain video that is on, you know, on loop or maybe programmed or something like that. So trying to, <laughs> trying to experiment internally before I bring it <laughs> externally to keep the interest, um, to keep the interest there and, you know, widening the reach. And then accessibility. Am I happy to keep, keep going? Yes, please, please, please. <laughs> uh, the next one's from Lincoln. Oh. <laughs> uh, who are up and coming filmmakers working on themes of black tenderness that you're excited about? Oh my gosh. Okay. Raven Jackson's All Dirt Roads Taste of Salt. This film really is a film that is like. It has a lot of hand shots, very few words. It's it, it, it's one of those films where, you know, when people are like, I can't really describe it, but <laughs> it's so great. It, but it, I can't describe it, and it is really great. It's it. This film really just evokes this idea that hands are the window to the soul through its textures and layers, and it's just so tender. And Raven Jackson has a great short um, on the Criterion channel. And um, I think that she is the one to watch. And the film came out through A24. So I'm not the only one who knows that she's, <laughs> she's someone to watch. Yes, in the room. I don't mean to skip ahead of the digital people. <laughs> um, I'm obsessed with your big themes and categories, but are there any specific um, themes or like specific tenderness gestures that you kind of saw pop up over and over and over again? If you could give a couple examples of that, whether it's like head nods or handshakes or whatever, is there something that you kind of saw, oh, this happens all the time? So there's this thing, especially when you get into 80s, 90s cinema, um, that black people will look each other in frame and kind of be like, 
okay. You know, it's it can be a warning. It can be, and it is a gesture of understanding. It's you know, it can be a. It just it, the knowingness of the eyes is something that is so prevalent across film, and I know we see that in real life, but it's so interesting to see how those social cues are played and if you're not looking you kind of miss it and to me I think that's that's the, the joy that I find um and really that was gonna be my as you as you heard that's gonna be my organizing principle because I just kept seeing those gestures of understanding I kept seeing the those moments of embrace that you know just stood out to me and it made me feel something but I think that maybe there is something that I can do down the line that kind of because I did outline those so, so maybe there's something I can re-elevate um, in some way, which I'd be happy to, because that is kind of where the heart of this started for me. Because um, if I think about people in my community, I, it is that, you know, you see a black person running, you're running. Like, to, <laughs> to me, just that knowingness, like that, that connection of community. And it's not always in Tinder Act, but it can be. So <laughs> to me, that's, that's really cool. Thank you for your question. Is there another digital question? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so the next one is from Tori. Um, how has the theme of love and tenderness changed over the history of black film? Oh, that's really interesting. So I spoke a lot about, in my presentation, about um, race films, because just this idea of pioneers wanting to explore their own communities Something that I've been thinking a lot about is integrationist films, which came, you know, of course, after race films in the 1950s, when, you know, uh, Sidney Poitier is coming onto screen, and this idea of who are we with white people? And something I, I think I did fail to mention in my presentation is that these films are black people connecting with other black people. I don't have... I didn't, well, I didn't focus on um, interracial dynamics in tenderness, but throughout the history of film, to answer the question, um, you know, in the 60s, we have these run of black films that, like Nothing But a Man, that expand the definition of what black cinema can be, because Nothing But a Man has a white director, white writer, and I was on stage with Charles Burnett interviewing him, and he said that this film, and it's something I agree with, changed him because he believes in film as a tool of social change. And this film, which is romantic, and also you know lays bare the soul of being a black man in America without being grotesque or overindulgent, um, you know, he, he was a, a film student at UCLA at the time, and he's just like, how did they get that right? <laughs> you know, how did they understand this? And it just expands this notion of possibility, black film, and it also inspired his films directly. So then, of course, we have the 70s, which, you know, then they have exploitation, but there also is a pre exploitation with uh, Melvin Van Peebles' films. Uh, Sunlight is a short that he did in, in uh, San Francisco that I have on the site. There's this idea of black filmmakers starting revolutions, but also seeing how, even in a Paris blues, right, how these ideas of black belonging are translated in film when it reaches out to black people, even if it's not understood otherwise, is something I'm also trying to capture. So then you have the 80s, of course, this is post, um, this is post The Wiz when, you know, Hollywood decides that they no longer want to invest in black cinema. And the 80s is another era of integrationist movies. You have the buddy cop, you know, those kinds of things. But you also have filmmakers, black filmmakers, who cannot get funding for their films. So you now have, you know, the Spike Lees and other people who are mirroring the pursuit that the early filmmakers of the race films did, which is to say, how can film represent my life? And not all of those films are tender films, but that impulse and some of those creations can be tender. 
And the, the site ends in the 90s. So in the 90s, of course, you have the black romance movement in film. So you have the Love Jones, you have the Boomerangs, you know, all of, all of these films that redefine how we show up in movies. And that's and the whole reason I had to expand my site to the 90s was to... I don't think you can talk about black tenderness in film without including those films. So that's my off-the-dome short... <laughs> Short explanation. Um, I hope that suffices. Yes. <laughs> um, next one is from Sophia. Okay. You mentioned that you initially wanted to dive into the gestures of tenderness. Yes. Could you ex expand on this initial idea? Yeah, so um, when I first charted out some of the films I wanted to use for the site, I labeled them by gesture and I think it made sense to me. It made sense to the people I was working with, but I don't know how that could have translated to a digital design and then how that could have translated to understanding without me having to over explain. So I, where I got from, you know, the pillars that I, you have now is seeing how those gestures are, in those pillars, like how is a gesture of understanding or a head nod or, you know, whatever it may be, how does that show up in community? How does that show up in family, you know, in a romance? So that's kind of where I landed because I wanted it to be something that if I'm not there, you just see the page, you get it instantly, you know? So. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, so the next one is from Amber. Amber says, this is so amazing and brilliant. Um, they love the way you build out tenderness. Um, they wonder if and how you might put, in, uh, put it in conversation with the black feminist eth ethics of care a la Patricia Hill Collins. Oh my gosh, yes. Seems to be some really generative synchronicities. So something that is fascinating, and what I failed to mention in my presentation is that the next thing I'm doing, because my residency does not end today, <laughs> the next thing I'm doing is, is uh, making a film. And a part of the film is ex expanding this idea more than the site does, more than this lecture did, and talking to filmmakers about how t t they work in, ten in tender ways. And I think, you know, a lot of the filmmakers I've been in touch with are black women filmmakers, and that does not feel, black feminist filmmakers specifically, and that does not feel like it's a coincidence. It feels just like a very intentional way because black women filmmakers, most of their films, their first impulse in making cinema is to show a black woman. You know, if I think about Ayo Shinzira, her first film is her mentor, that she's, you know, she's making a film about her mentor. If I think about, you know, any of any many of these black women filmmakers, like this is their, this is their impulse and understanding of the world. They want to pick up a camera to show someone in their community, and that is just such a unique thing that I I'm trying to um, get on film to kind of speak to exactly what they're saying. Yes. <laughs> Two grown males. I'm sure there are, because I think another par portion of tenderness that I didn't really touch on is this idea of revolutionary spirit that comes from tenderness, because if I think, if I am defining tenderness as where possibility blooms as a part of it, then revolution is naturally the next, or it can naturally be the next step. Um, and in that scenario, yes, but like just general tenderness of hugging, yes, but I'm failing to come up with one off the top of my head. If they email me, I can, I, I will think of one or some, probably some. <laughs> Devaluing the social impact opportunities telling the truth provides. 
Um, Dr. Foreman, that's a great question. Uh, <laughs> you know, something that's a, and that's an area I've struggled with because I think, and not in the sense that it doesn't exist, but in the sense I don't ever want my work to minimize the original intent of art. And not to say that bringing a new definition minimizes, but if you're not fully bringing someone along with your scholarship, it can, as a result, minimize. So there are horror films that I've listed, but I'm, it's a thought that's in progress for me. And that's a part of the continued work because I, I feel like that, not that horror is an, an area that I shy away from, but it is, when I think of this work, it's not the area I'm like running towards, you know what I mean? So honestly, you stumped me. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Do you feel as, as though this sort of framework lends us a vocabulary that will allow us to interpret black film as, as more than indexes of our public resistance and thus allow us to apprehend, uh, uh, apprehend our lives in excess of our contest, contestation of anti-blackness? Yeah, I think that's really interesting because I think something I struggle with is defining black film through Hollywood, which is I feel like a lot of modern film criticism lends itself towards when throughout time so many of the films that have those spirits of transformation and you know possibility exist without outside of Hollywood structures or by a miracle within and or in in really more direct terms resisting those structures and trying to create from beyond those frameworks of limited categorization. So I think that, yeah, the, the answer is definitely yes, but, you know, as the work develops, I hope to get, <laughs> to get a more concrete yes and point to direct ways um, throughout the filmography. Any in-room questions? Oh, I, there's a glare I cannot see, oh. <laughs> Um, I think off the top of my head, I could offer just an old sweet song, which is a television film that Melvin Van Peebles did. Um, and it has Cecily Tyson in it. And I don't, I don't, I can't recall off the top of my head who the children are, but, um, I would say that that is a family film that, that meets your question. I'm, and sorry to repeat the question is, can I think of a film that has a father tenderly raising their um, children. And I think just an old sweet song is what you're looking for. And it was supposed to, it was a, it was a pilot that never got made. So, you know, those kind of become television films. So. Any other in-room questions? Any other digital questions? <laughs> My hopes and dreams for the future of Black Film Archive are to keep it going um, without breaking my own soul. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, the no, my hopes and my hopes and dreams are to really just do what I need to do to stay committed. To stay, look, I don't want to be too busy for the work that I care about, and how can I continuously prioritize? my audience, my, and, and my desire to, to keep it going. I, and I, I, I genuinely do mean that. So beyond that, the public facing <laughs> um, goals are to just keep on expanding. I think, I mean, I, I do want to integrate a, a genuine database without 
it being too cumbersome because I think a lot of scholars do reach out to me and want, you know, to learn more information about a certain film. And there's a lot of information about films that I just have from my research. So what are some ways to incorporate that without it being too overwhelming and too much of a change is really the, the next question for me um, that I think I need to answer pretty soon. <laughs> Kind of like a follow-up question. Um, uh, he's curious to hear to learn more about the process of listening to your audience. Oh, yeah. And how you translate the responses into the experience of the website expansion? Was that any different from your process of creating the initial launch? Well, the initial launch of Black Film Archive was me talking to my friends and then not understanding what I was doing. <laughs> so it was a little. It's a little bit different. Um, I think for the expansion, I get a lot of letters. So a lot of people are complimenting, oh my God, I love how easy it is to use. A lot of elders write to me and are constantly, you know, saying, I love that I can just click the link. You know, I don't have to think about a million different things. And that, I, I really do internalize that because I think something that happens is some corner of the internet that you love and that you spend a lot of time on suddenly wants to do everything and everything loses its essence of what it really was and I don't want to do that like I want to model my site after the internet I grew up with which is just places that were tools of infinite possibility infinite exploration and adding a lot of information not that it it, it distracts from that it, it certainly doesn't but only if it's done right and only if it's done with care. So for the expansion to answer their question, it was a different kind of set of criteria. It was a different kind of impulse that I'm operating with because I now know the, the audience's initial response to the building of blackfromarchive.com that I can take with me as I work through various tools, various, <laughs> um, ideas of how to make this look and how to make this function and know that I'm hopefully delivering something that makes sense immediately. That's, oh, one, uh, one more question? One more question, okay, we'll do one. Oh, wait, okay, is there one in the room? Okay, so digital question? Okay, so we'll do the last one. Um, yes. That's really interesting because so much of my focus has been on not director's intent, but uh, approach and um, my own <laughs> reaction to it because I'm um, developing the scholarship. I think in the coming weeks when I, I pull, pull up that form that we're going to put on, this, on the tenderness site of ideas of how other people experience tenderness will really be the test of that. Of course, when I watch any film, I look at the reviews of the film at the time. So I do have a general, not even general sense, a good sense of how films are received in their moment. But I think so often black films are dismissed. So I, I hesitate to use that, not to say I dismiss black spectatorship, but often the reviews of the film can be dismissive without really engaging critically with the ideas that I'm trying to elevate. So it's kind of just a balance between all the possible information about a certain film. Yes, okay, an in-person question. <laughs> no, please. Um, I was wondering with um, the conversations that are happening in our community about specifically like movies about slavery. Yes. If like, is it, do you think it's possible to portray what has been a, a large part of our recent history with tenderness? Well, um, the question is, with the um, conversation about slavery movies, is it possible to portray slavery and like subjects with tenderness? And, excuse me, if I think about... 
if I think about Underground Railroad, Barry Jenkins' television show on Amazon Prime, it feels like the answer is yes. And to me, I don't think that any subject should be off limits for film. I, <laughs> I, I think that film, we have film as a a proof of living, but also as um, an examination of social attitudes of, you know, of expressions of, of so much. It doesn't just, it sh- should just boil down to be read in one way. And I think so often what happens when we say, you know, I'm tired of slave films, I'm tired of this, I'm tired of that, which I don't dismiss those concerns because I think, you know, but if I think across time, <laughs> the amount of slave films, uh, slave films that have been made are very few. There are very, very few films, and this is not even a total represent, representation of what black cinema is. Um, so I just, you know, I, what I hope to do is show people that there are other offerings that they can gravitate towards, that they can enjoy and um, take pride in. So, thank you. Thank you all so much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much.